All right. I think we can, uh, we can start. I think uh, uh, all of you knows uh, about uh, the uh, great uh, um, experimental effort that uh, um, is, uh, is put into looking for primordial gravitational waves. And uh, I, I don't think uh, um, anybody will complain if I say that this uh, uh, effort uh, is led at the moment by uh, the BICEP uh, uh, collaboration. So the, we, are, we are going to, to learn more about uh, uh, the theory behind uh, uh, gravitational, primordial gravitational waves next week. Um, and we, we are happy to have uh, Chaolin Kuo from uh, Stanford, uh, who is uh, one of the principal investigators of this uh, uh, collaboration. And uh, his title is uh, uh, Search for Inflationary Gravitational Waves with B-Mode Polarization, the BICEP Program and Beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. So, so the key point here is uh, not only the gravitational waves, as you know, have been discovered by LIGO uh, recently, uh, but we knew that it existed even before that. Um, so the key here is we're trying to look for the primordial gravitational wave that uh, came from the beginning. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that if you look at the edge of space, which is black hole, you use gravitational wave. If you look for edge of, uh, of time, you look for gravitational wave as well, uh, which is the thing that I'm talking about. So it's just a coincidence. Uh, maybe not. OK, so as you learned from the summer school, that cosmic microwave background is this interface between opaque and ionized and hot, dense uh, epoch of the universe. Um, to the uh, transparent, uh, neutral uh, universe. And that uh, interface looks like a firewall in all directions that's opaque to photons. Um, so it has a typical 2.7 Kelvin black body radiation, and uh, there's tiny temperature fluctuation on it in different directions. And um, it's great. Um, you can learn lots of information from it, but it's also a firewall that you can't penetrate. You can't look beyond that wall just using photons because it's opaque beyond that point, or the universe was opaque earlier than that epoch. So you don't see any of that, OK? Except you need a messenger that interacts very weakly with all that hot, dense uh, medium, uh, which is uh, gravitational waves, which, uh, of course, interacts very weakly because gravity is so weak compared to other forces. So in principle, by using gravitational waves, you can study the beginning of everything. And that beginning, lots of theories have this interesting feature of rapid expansion, which you will hear about next week, uh, known as the inflationary period. So we don't directly try to detect the gravitational waves like the LIGO guys do. Instead, we look for uh, electromagnetic radiation from the surface of last gathering, the cosmic microwave background radiation. So we look for an imprint of gravitational wave on um, that cosmic microwave background polarization. Okay, so we look for microwave linear polarization. We construct a pattern, and that pattern could be an imprint of primordial gravitational waves. Okay, so this is a microwave experiment looking for a gravitational wave uh, in, uh, in particular. Linear polarization, okay, the pattern. It's not circular polarization or anything. It's linear polarization creating a pattern of a, of a curl on the sky. So you're going to hear more about this, but inflation is a process that inflates space, uh, but also the quantum fluctuation in space itself uh, for any fields that you have around that time. So uh, for the infoton field itself that was responsible for inflation, um, that fluctuation was inflated into density perturbation that you now see in microwave background or galaxy structures. So that part is verified uh, to extremely high precision. And it looks just like inflation, very similar to inflation. So the quanta of gravity it's not all zero and empty everywhere because uh, everything has to be quantum mechanical, uh, is inflated by inflation to create a background of stochastic 
gravitational waves. That's what we're trying to study here. So the two processes are very similar. Exact, uh, in fact, they're described by very similar equations that describe the uh, amplitude of uh, this perturbation or amplitude of uh, tensor perturbation, very similar. And that solution looks, uh, for a particular Fourier mode, that solution looks like this. It has a, a decaying um, Fourier uh, wave thing, and then the amplitude is frozen at horizon exit um, when that, the wavelength of that mode is comparable to um, the Hubble length at that time. Okay, so beyond that point, the wave uh, becomes frozen, the amplitude becomes frozen until that, um, until the universe expands, until inflation ends and the universe expands to include that wavelength, naturally to include that wavelength. So next week you're gonna hear more about this, but for a given Fourier mode, for a fixed, ample, uh, fixed wavelength, co-moving wavelength, uh, so that mode exits the horizon during inflation, the amplitude is frozen until it re enters into the horizon. So it was uh, like uh, it uh, leaves first and enters, uh, uh, leaves late and enters early. So that uh, picture here, and as the universe expands. So this is different uh, wavelength, different Fourier modes, okay? So as you recall, cosmic micro background is a snapshot at a time, okay? So you're just seeing all these Fourier modes so some of these Fourier modes are beyond the horizon. Some of these Fourier modes are already inside of the horizon. So if you flip this picture this way, not yet, uh, you see uh, something like this, okay? And this is that uh, interface. This is the horizon scale. Beyond that, it's everything, all the modes are outside of the horizon, and this is all inside of the horizon, already processed by uh, gravitational, sorry, ordinary classical physics. This is an actual measurement made by Planck experiment of uh, ESA. Uh, this is a temperature power spectrum uh, plotted against theory. So this must be uh, like one of the most well, successful physics exper experiment out there that verifies a theory. Okay, so this is an actual measurement, not, you know, and the spectrum looks like this, just like the theory predicted. So we're getting serious about this picture, you know, this, uh, this whole mechanism, you know, generation of uh, perturbation and the processes uh, that involves the perturbation. And uh, the uh, tensor part or the gravitational wave part is a natural byproduct of all of this, okay? So this is all real. So now we just don't know what the amplitude is of that uh, tensor component or the gravitational wave component. So I use the two words interchangeably, uh, primordial gravitational waves or tensor, okay? Um, so the amplitude of the gravitational wave tells you the energy scale of inflation because it tells you the uh, um, exit of horizon, that, that scale that I was telling you about. Um, I, I'm not going to derive all of this next week, somebody else will. So inflation field range during inflation, uh, the field range uh, during inflation, whether it's greater or smaller than the Planck scale, depends on whether R is greater or smaller than roughly 0.01 plus or minus an order of magnitude, or half an order of magnitude, okay? So if you measure R to be 0.05, you know uh, the infoton field moves more than a Planck scale during inflation. This is just from the integral of the inflation uh, equation, assuming a single field slow roll. So you, you need to have quantum gravity in order to have any probation. So gravity has to be quantized. So if you see classical gravitational waves, stochastic on the sky, just like when you say these, you see these probation came from quantum mechanics, this has to come from quantum gravity. Um, and if you see a scale invariant tensor, you're just measuring the Hubble scale during inflation. So it'll be very hard to not say that the Hubble scale or um, the scales that drive the expansion of the universe, uh, the energy density remains constant during inflation. So that's almost the definition of inflation, if you will. Okay, so that's why, you know, 
the search for this uh, B mode is, is a big deal because of all these theoretical reasons. Not because we want to discover gravitational wave yet over again. Okay. So we don't try to directly measure the metric, space-time metric. Instead, we search for a pattern uh, in cos cosmic microwave background polarization. So it was due to these guys who proposed um, that you just look for a curl component in the linear polarization in the microwave background. Um, so this mode that looks like a radial pattern or circular pattern is called E mode or gradient mode. And this uh, curl, curly pattern is known as the curl mode or the B mode, uh, analogous to uh, electromagnetism. So polarization pattern, as you know, uh, this blue sky is polarized by radius scattering. So radius scattering is nothing but just, you know, ENM wave moving the, you know, charge in the molecule, air molecule around. So it's very similar to Thomson scattering, which is just free electron version of that, same thing. So if you take a polarizer and map that blue sky, what, what would you get? So the only source, active source, is the sun, which is unpolarized, largely. So the sky is polarized, as you know, whoever had sunglasses. Uh, but if you just go one step beyond that, you map the polarization of the whole sky. All right, what would you see? You're going to see this. You're going to see a circular pattern around the sun uh, because there's no other way. You can't, you can't create this curl pattern. There's nothing that breaks that left right symmetry. Right? Okay, so that unpolarized light gets scattered by the molecules there has to be polarized perpendicular to that direction. There's no way you can get this, okay? So this is, in fact, a beam of polarization what, that you won't see caused by radius scattering. So this is a nice high school you know, science project. If you have cousins to supervise, tell them to do this, like looking for beam modes in the uh, blue sky. So just for this summer school, uh, we created a little app that demonstrate that. Okay, so you have a source, and you just, you know, there's a ring of free electrons doing the scattering, and uh, you can linearly superpose uh, these, and you get different. You can even move the circle. That's too much. I mean, don't, like, my undergrad just got too excited about Java programming. <laughs> but anyway, you see what I'm saying? So no matter what you do, you can't create a curl, OK? You just keep adding sources. You just add it in third dimension. You can't create a curl unless you have gravitational waves or lensing or dust. Somebody is going to ask me a question about that later. But um, though that's my theoretical introduction of why we're doing this, and why is this related to gravitational waves, and why is this related to inflation? So now, how, how are you doing this? Look, this is an experiment that proves Big Bang or proves the origin of us or so on. Everybody should be doing it. Why is it so hard? Like, why is it so competitive? Because even though that nice pattern is unique, the degree of polarization defined by the linear polarization power difference is one part in 30 million, okay? So it's usually called an unpolarized light, not polarization, okay? So if you measure this light, it's highly polarized compared to this, I guarantee you. So this is not just a matter of getting the sensitivity to see sub-micro Kelvin, you know, temperature differences but also make sure you're not measuring the polarization of the instrument itself, okay, to better than one part in 30 million, okay? Usually that's impossible, but fortunately, you know, we learn a few tricks, and each trick can get you down a um, factor of 20, 30, and you multiply these together, all of so, you know, all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're getting there, okay? So it's a little hard to just write down in a textbook you know, how you're going to do this from first principles. So, you know, that's why it's also very fun to be an experimentalist, you know. And if you're sharp in physics, if you have sharp physics intuition, 
you can add another technique to bring this down by another order of magnitude, okay? That sometimes is kind of opaque in textbooks. So, um, I've been doing this in this place for the past 15 years. Uh, this is South Pole. Um, and how far away of this from the South Pole itself? It's directly at the South Pole. We walk by the pole of the South Pole every day to get lunch um, out in the cold. Um, so this is a great place to do cosmic microwave background because uh, it's actually a desert. So South Pole is the driest place on Earth. Not the Sahara, not the Mojave Desert, deep here. Because even if you have 100% humidity, there's no water because the cold temperatures just can't sustain any water vapor in the atmosphere. Also, it only, only had one day and one night. That's how we trick our winter over to observe for us. We say, you observe for one night, <laughs> only one night, OK? Uh, but then, you know, he's stuck there uh, for six months. So there's great logistical support from uh, a United States NSF Office of Polar Program. Um, so the flights are military flights. I had to brief to the commander once uh, to tell her, it was a woman, what we were doing. It was the commander of the entire U.S. Air Force. Um, I had to brief to her what we were doing at the South Pole using her fleet once. So this is the collaboration uh, in a collaboration meeting that we had about a year ago, okay? It's, uh, it's getting bigger um, as, uh, as we're building more and more receivers and we're running into foregrounds and other issues in analysis, okay? So we're including more and more people in this collaboration, but it's not uh, LHC you know, size yet, hopefully. So this is kind of the evolution of the project uh, since uh, we even skip uh, BICEP 1. Okay, so since BICEP 1 was uh, 20, uh, 2005, we started doing this at the same place using a similar technique. Okay. Um, from BICEP 1 to BICEP 2, we implemented a, uh, from just traditional horn coupled detectors like the Planck satellite has to full lithographic uh, superconductive detectors. Uh, and then we copy that receiver five times over to form an array. We call it Keck Array. It's still observing now. BISO 2 is done, by the way. BISO 2 has been replaced by BISO 3 in the year 2005. They're all very similar, but in fact, they're very different because BISO 3 is like several times bigger than BISO 2, so it, they look the same on the picture or in a drawing, but when you're building it, you know how uh, that's the challenge, that's the big step that you have to go. So BICEP 3 has been observing since 2015. Just this past few months, we fully populated the focal plane. And then uh, we're moving to an array uh, of uh, BICEP 3-like uh, telescopes, um, starting hopefully in two years. Call, we call BICEP array. There's an extra three in there. So these are all refracted telescopes, um, used similar to the ones used by Kepler a long time ago, not far from here, or Galileo. <clears throat> so these are microwave telescopes using ceramic or plastic lenses, two lenses, uh, and the detectors are operating at uh, 0.25 Kelvin, low temperature detectors. Um, it's similar to a typical tabletop. The size is also similar to a tabletop condensed matter experiment, except we have to open up the window. Otherwise, you don't see anything. And um, 100 watts of radiation is just going in. And you have to reject all of that before you can cool the detectors down. So very different sets of uh, challenges just from there. Okay. So the detectors are polarization sensitive. Like I said earlier, we're measuring linear polarization, which is defined to be the E square, the power difference between this polarization versus that. That's Q, or rotate the whole thing by 45 degrees. That's uh, U polarization. Okay. So we have two sets of antennas, one for each polarization, and we have two detectors that monitors the power entering those antenna, and you take the difference as the telescope scans. 
Okay, so you're constantly taking the difference between two polarization as the, as the telescope scans, and then you spin the telescope around, you move it up and down to form a map. So the actual detection of power is done through a superconductive thermometer. It's a superconductive film bias at the transition from normal to superconductivity. So that makes it a very uh, sensitive thermometer. So that monitors the temperature uh, of the CMB light coming from the antenna getting dumped into this uh, resistor heating up the island. Okay, so you're just measuring the temperature of that island uh, to give you an idea of what, what's the power coming through from the antenna. One for each polarization, and you take the two, the difference of the two. Okay, some glamour shot of uh, these detectors. And then you just go through map making to make a polarization map uh, where you know, at each pixel you have a length and a direction. That's the definition of uh, linear polarization. And all of a sudden, so this is BICEF2, by the way. All of a sudden, and this is actual data, all of a sudden you see this is mostly E mode already. So remember that, either circular or radial pattern. And indeed, if you just go through linear algebra and project out the E modes, this is all you get. So what we measure is mostly E mode. Already, that's a huge success for that nice picture of uh, you know, CMB photon scattering light has to generate E mode. Okay. But you know, we're doing something harder. We want to blow up the scale and see whether there's B mode left. And that's what we did. Okay. And now the scale is at uh, 0.3 microkelvin. On top of 3 kelvin, micro, micro kelvin, 3 kelvin, this is micro kelvin, 3 kelvin microwave background, and on top of 10 kelvin emission from the atmosphere, and another 10 from the instrument. Okay, so you're trying to measure the temperature difference of 0.3 micro kelvin over 30 kelvin of loading. Okay, very little difference. So that's why you need very sensitive detectors. And uh, that integration, you know, took three years, right? Okay, so you have to just integrate out the noise uh, to get the map. So, BICEF2 saw a lot of the beam polarization. You've heard about that. So, and we threw in Keck data taken through the end of uh, 2014, uh, and this, and you just turn that into a power spectrum. Power spectrum is a amplitude as a function of wavelength. Okay, you're gonna hear more about, or maybe you have heard about it already. So this is multiple moment or just wave number. Um, this is about one degree. And uh, this line is the prediction from gravitational lensing, which comes from second order of, uh, of scalar perturbation, basically scalar perturbation lens uh, by large scale structure can generate a beam of polarization. And you, nowadays, you know exactly what that level would be. And this is what BICEP and Keck measure at uh, 150 gigahertz. So this is way beyond what the lensing predicted. So people got excited, we got excited, okay? So now, whether this was actually a gravitational wave, which had a spectrum that, you know, at a peak at around L of 100, by the way, you have to look at other frequencies. <clears throat> so in year 2014, after the initial announcement of a detection of this thing, uh, we started working with the Planck uh, uh, collaboration. So Planck is a satellite mission that produced that beautiful temperature polarization map, okay? So it has also polarization measurements across a wide frequency band. So the instantaneous sensitivity at each direction, each small patch, each pixel is not very great. But the nice thing is it has very wide sky coverage, uh, all whole sky actually. And it has coverage all the way out to 850 gigahertz. <clears throat> uh, we're in particular interested in the 353 gigahertz polarization measurement uh, because that has the largest sensitivity to galactic dust which is also polarized. So we started working with them. Also, in the meantime, 
around 2014, um, but right after we saw something in the signal in the maps, you know, around mid early 2013, actually, we decided to put in uh, two receivers at lower frequency. <clears throat> okay, so combining all of that, combining Planck uh, and uh, this uh, low frequency observations, which is less sensitive to dust. Uh, in fact, you can already see that this is the galaxy, okay? And uh, at high frequency, you see nothing but dust from the galaxy, even at high galactic latitude. And uh, at lower frequencies, like 100, uh, you see less dust polarization. And at lower, even yet lower frequency, you start to see a lot of synchrotron radiation. We don't look in that direction, obviously. Our field is around here, okay, out here. Okay, combining all of that, this is still 150 only. So this is 95 only, okay? So 95 has less sensitivity to dust. And uh, if uh, this signal is coming from primordial, it'll have the same amplitude, or it'll scatter around, the, the red point will scatter around that higher point, green point. You can also form cross-correlation between 95 and 150 gigahertz. And this is the result, okay? And if you just go through statistical analysis, you, can't, you can no longer say there's an excess from, for example, uh, the 95 gigahertz and 150 above the gravitational lensing. If all of this came from uh, primordial, then all of these points will scatter around the same region, but it, instead they all came down. So. Going through the statistical analysis, um, one has to conclude that we've detected a lot of dust. Okay, this is the amplitude of dust. Zero is ruled out to high significance. That means we see dust at high significance now. There is a lot of dust, and, but we can't say there is a tensor anymore. So zero is not ruled out at all after you throw in uh, Planck 353 and, um, and uh, CAC 95 gigahertz data. Uh, but we're st we started to do interesting uh, inflationary science already. So at uh, R of 0 0.12, 0 0.13, there is the famous uh, phi square model, which just means the inflaton potential is a, uh, point, uh, is a parabola. So that, at, up till this point, can explain everything in the universe. So that simple model. So inflaton field has a parabolic potential. It generates, it produces everything we see today. Okay, so that's a nice model. But now that nice model is being um, disfavored, okay, by, by this result and only by this result. And in the power spectrum space, uh, this is what we got. So this is that lensing that uh, one always get. And uh, this is uh, the inflationary or tensor uh, spectrum that we're looking for. Okay, so, and this is the latest result when you throw in everything. So, of course, you know, lensing has been detected by other experiments as well, but looks like we've also detected a lot of lensing uh, at uh, this intermediate angular scale. But we're most interested in this uh, low L point, which are now uh, upper limits only. Okay. I should say, if you look at the, um, what are these colors? Brown, orangish points, right? These are the most sensitive measurements on primordial beam mode, okay? Well, not, they're not exactly primordial, they're, they're crossed between 95 and, and 150, so it has some dust contribution at 95 as well. Uh, but, it, you know, to first approximation, these are the primordial measurements. And uh, the size of the error bar is larger than the size of the error bar uh, from bicep CAC at 150 gigahertz. So look at how tiny the error bars are for the green points. And that's coming from the subtraction of Planck dust template. So we're now limited by our knowledge to, uh, to dust. Um, but you can get more leverage 
on, uh, on dust by going to yet higher frequency. So the next atmospheric window uh, that you can observe is about 220 gigahertz. So we have already collected uh, two seasons worth of 220 gigahertz data. And the map sensitivity is already better than Planck sensitivity to dust at 353. So pretty soon, when we throw in uh, our own 220 gigahertz data, um, the error bar will start to shrink again. Okay, right now, it, it doesn't make sense to observe at 150 more because we've already seen high signal to noise of something. So right now, we need to minimize the uncertainty introduced by doing the subtraction or doing the component separation, which currently came from Planck. And we also have a rather limited sensitivity, as you can tell, at 95. So the error bar from 95 auto spectrum uh, are much larger than 150. So we want to add a lot more at 95 and improve on uh, dust template, sensitivity to dust template. Okay. So a theorist will just take a look at this plot and just walk out from the talk, right? So <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> but this is the bottom line, uh, N sub S versus R plot uh, when you throw in everything we've got so far. Plunk temperature, low uh, L polarization. Oh, I guess it's being updated <clears throat> from WMAP, I think, for this case. Uh, lensing, and then bicep CAC uh, 14, direct um, BMO measurement. So far, bicep CAC is the only experiment directly pushing down in this direction. And um, that phi square model is sitting out here already. Um, this is two sigma. Okay? So the cyan is two sigma. So it's, it's out at almost three sigma. Okay. And also, I was reminded uh, by uh, Sterbinsky that uh, we've already disfavored most of the um, con convex models. Okay. Yeah. Which some people like better than the plateau type models. So, this is where we are when we throw in everything. So we just put out another paper yesterday, and that was about lensing. So like I said, so this part between L of 150 and 350, we've detected a lot of B modes. That's definitely not dust, okay? And uh, that looks like lensing. It follows the lensing power spectrum, and it has the right amplitude. And we know lensing should be there, so this should be lensing. But we went ahead and do the analysis. Um, so there is a, a method that you can combine emo polarization. This is the emo polarization measured by uh, bicep CAC in green. And the B mode, um, also measured by bicep CAC in blue dashed line compared to simulations. Okay? So from the E modes and B modes, so those few points are the you know, now known to be dust dominated. But we just cut it off at L of 150 and use this region of B mode and all of this E mode to do lensing reconstruction. Again, you're gonna hear about that next week or you heard about it a long time ago. You can reconstruct um, the intervening dark matter potential field using E mode and B mode or if you just throw in higher order statistics, um, all of the CMB measurements. And you can create a power spectrum for the convergence. It's very similar to weak lensing. It's, in fact, a weak lensing. And you can calculate the power spectrum. This is a many sigma, many sigma detection. Um, and the interesting thing is uh, you can now derive the expected lensing amplitude solely from either the power spectrum, the BMO power spectrum, which just tells you the, about the amplitude of BMO, right? It has nothing to do with lensing or anything, you just guess it's, it's lensing. So you can derive an amplitude from B, BK, uh, BB, the auto power, and you get a value that's close to Lambda CDM with uncertainty, within uncertainties, 
And you can go ahead and do the lensing reconstruction and calculate the um, lensing derived lensing amplitude uh, directly. And it also agrees with um, <clears throat> uh, lambda CDM. So I think it's lensing, but it's not news to you, perhaps, that this is indeed lensing. But the interesting thing is, if you want to have a theory that can predict B-mode power in this L range, it's beginning to, the, the room is getting smaller. Uh, because the stuff that we measured not only had a lensing power spectrum, but also had lensing statistics. So the good agreement between these two numbers tells you how much room you still have if you want to squeeze in an alternative model of BMOs like string generated uh, Kaiser Steppen uh, effect type thing. So where are we going with this? So obviously we want to add more and more receivers to get more and more sensitivity. Um, I already showed you this. Uh, so this is that big jump we have to make from bicep two to keck. Yeah, if you don't put things with the appropriate scale, you don't know what we have to go through over the past few years. Theorists. So, and uh, that incurred a lot of challenges. Uh, infrared loading, we have to develop all new infrared filters that are completely transparent in our band, but completely opaque, hopefully, in the infrared. How do you do that? We have to build big, bigger lenses, anti reflection coat them, so that, that they'll still work at 4 Kelvin. And um, and we have to build, completely redesign the focal plane so that uh, the receivers now take modular um, uh, focal plane modules. Okay, there's some pictures taken over the past two years. Um, I guess this is only a few months ago. And finally, we have a fully populated focal plane, all at 95 gigahertz. So if you go through the math, you realize in terms of power, at 95 gigahertz, it has uh, six times less power sensitivity to dust, okay, if you normalize the CMB unit, okay. So what are the bicep, C, bicep two Cs if the dust component will automatically reduce by a factor of six at 95 gigahertz? And we have already confirmed the sensitivity of bicep three is at the, roughly the Keck array uh, level, okay. So it's running at seven to nine microcamera root second. So that means we are completely on track, okay? So this is our sensitivity at 95. We had no sensitivity before we add, added 95 gigahertz receiver. We were just integrating away um, silly at uh, 150 gigahertz. And then it will say, oh, we have to add 95. And we started adding that two years ago. And now BICEP3 is on track to follow the slope down to catch up with our sensitivity at 150 gigahertz, okay, with much less uh, contamination with dust. And we also added 220 gigahertz, which is harder on the ground because the atmosphere is bright. Um, at 220 gigahertz, it's a lot of water vapor. And, uh, but we did that uh, at the end of 2014, and you started to see the line coming down, okay? And we are here, midway through here. So this is helping this effort because uh, there is enhanced sensitivity to dust sampling. And like I said, even at this point, our sensitivity to dust is already better than Planck's sensitivity to dust at 353 gigahertz. Okay. Just a brief summary here. <clears throat> um, and this is my finding chart. <laughs> in a review article by Kim Mikowski and Kovetz uh, that came out a few months ago. Okay, so now, very roughly, R is limited to below 0 0.1, 0 0.07. We like that 30% less, but, you know. but as a theorist, you, you say it's less than 0.1. So it was published in a series of papers in PRL over the past two years. Uh, the latest limit is 0.07. This is two sigma, so one sigma is around 0.035. 0.035 or 0.03, we got unlucky and that got a little bit higher than one sigma, okay, then two times one sigma. And all of that sensitivity is dominated, that uncertainty is dominated by, uh, a lot of that is dominated by uh, our 
uh, mediocre sensitivity at 95, and also dust template, our sensitivity to dust, dust template from Plunk. Okay, so between one and five years, we're gonna keep observing with bicep three and keck receiver at 220 gigahertz, uh, and then we wanna add more receivers, the size of bicep three in the next few years. So over the next five to f one to five years, you know, R will be like two sigma, 0.01, you know, 0.02 will be easily achievable with the demonstrated uh, technique. And then if, uh, if it's not found, um, there are two big efforts. Um, one is a satellite mission called Lightbird. Uh, it's a Japanese uh, space agency mission with US contributions to detectors. And there's also a so-called ground-based uh, CMB S4, stage CMB S4 effort led by uh, the US Department of Energy Office of Science. Um, it becomes a lab project, like a uh, high energy uh, experiment um, project, experimental project. So both, both uh, missions <clears throat> are targeting 10 to the minus three level, okay? One sigma R, 10 to the minus three. So one is a whole sky survey with 15 bands in space, but because it's a space mission and also a cheap space mission, um, it doesn't have a lot of resolution, angular resolution, so it can only see up to this L, okay? Meaning it can't use uh, information from lensing to de-lens. Um, instead, you're, you're trying to take advantage of this little uh, bump at a very low L, very large scale. And in combination, you get to, and also the, the fact that you can get access to many, many frequencies in space that you can't uh, on the ground. So stage four CMB can't get access to that very low L thing, and it can't do a whole sky survey. Um, so in terms of tensor, it'll focus on a smaller patch, go very deep, uh, and uh, with uh, arc minute resolution uh, to do uh, de-lensing. So if you can reconstruct the lens, you can predict what the beam mode you will see at a degree scale. Just simply by lens, the emo polarization now measured to hundreds of sigma. So now this is, this is mapped to extremely well sensitivity. You just take your lens, you lens that E mode, and it becomes a template for B mode that it can, in principle, subtract uh, from the directly measured B mode. This is called the de-lensing technique. So these two complementary approaches, uh, in principle, should both reach uh, one sigma R of 10 to the minus three uh, by mid 2025, about 10 years from now. So let's look at this fun uh, finding chart, right? So um, there is inflation also inf affects the scalar perturbation and the spectral index for that perturbation. So under simple single field slow row inflationary models, uh, a constraint on NS uh, will lead to a constraint on R for a given model. So, and these are all the very interesting, very well-motivated models. And uh, this current constraint on NS translates into a three sigma bounds for each of the models on R, okay? So for example, oh, there's a phi square. Phi square, our two sigma is 0.07, so this is, yeah, this is really getting, getting ruled out at this point. So this is two sigma, okay? Uh, getting disfavored, heavily disfavored. So the next ones to go, <laughs> well, I don't imply that they are not you know, great, but if they are not the reality, the next ones to go are these ones, okay? So these will be heavily tested very soon. Okay, and um, then there's a class of model that predicts a uh, few times, uh, there's a central value, best fit, or uh, lower limit, upper limit. So, uh, so if we can get to that range with, uh, with these guys, then uh, you might be able to detect this even if you, if you do a little better than, uh, than this target or if, uh, 
if this value is a little higher. Uh, but if you want a five sigma detection of this particular Starobinsky type model, it may be hard, even with these guys. But you can pretty much rule out the rest, um, even before this experiment turns on. Okay. Yeah, so this is a 15 bands in, in space planned by Lightbird with uh, one sigma r of uh, 10 to the minus 3, uh, including all systematics and foreground uncertainties. So 2025. Okay. So CMB S4 is, uh, involves bigger telescopes. It'll map that lensing tail really well. 500,000 detectors on the ground. Again, mid 2020s. Um, so in addition to R, uh, it'll measure the number of species of relativistic particles, like neutrino-like particles, and uh, absolute mass, of, or sum of the total mass of neutrinos uh, to 16 milliEV, 0.016, roughly. Okay, I'll just put up my conclusion here, uh, and I'll take questions. Thank you. <laughs>